May the Lord bless you richly on this Father's Day, June 16th, which is also the fourth Sunday after Pentecost. And our thoughts are directed to seeds today. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The gospel for this Sunday is taken from Mark chapter 4, verses 26 to 34. And as I alluded to just a moment ago, it's all about seeds and planting. Jesus said, The kingdom of God is if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps, rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He doesn't know how. The earth produces by itself. First the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts on the sickle because the harvest has come. And he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parables shall we use for it? It's like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown in the ground is the smallest of all seeds on earth. And yet when it grows up, it becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Now with many such parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He hardly spoke to them at all without using a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. This is the gospel of our Lord. Let's pray. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let these words be yours and bless. Amen. Having read that gospel, I came up with this scenario in my own mind. It's that of a farmer. He's sitting with his feet propped up in a wraparound front porch of an old but well-maintained farmhouse way in the deep country. We're sitting together drinking lemonade. I, I'm younger. It's, it's like my first year as a pastor, and I'm visiting this farmer. I've grown up in small towns, but he's making me feel like I'm some sort of city boy. I'm curious about his crop. But he doesn't seem to know anything, at least not about the things that I'm asking him about. What are you growing? Whatever's out there, he replies, pointing vaguely at his field. Well, what did you plant? Seeds. So what are you doing now? Waiting. Waiting for what? The seeds to grow. Grow into what? First a sprout, then a stalk, then the head, then the full grain. Then what? Well, I harvest the crop. We, we sit in silence for a moment to let that all sink in. And then I ask, do you ever wonder how it all happens? Nope. Why not? Because it just does. And on it goes like that, very uncomfortable. I just sit there watching him just sit there, feeling incredibly foolish because I'm not quite sure what's going on and wondering why I feel foolish because all of this is part of, not part of my job, but his. And he doesn't seem to know any more about it than I do. So I wait. I sip my lemonade, determined that I'm not going to ask any more dumb, dumb questions. And just when I figure I'm sort of getting an idea, the farmer straightens up, squints out into the distance, jumps to his feet and then virtually leaps off the porch and grabbing a sickle, he heads out into the fields, racing, leaving me behind. <laughs> I, I, I guess the waiting part was over. Must be harvest time. And then, after a while, it's over. He comes back and sits down in the chair he had had been and looking very weary <laughs> but satisfied. Now, I know what you're thinking. Seed time and harvest in a single afternoon? Right, it doesn't make any sense. But this is my vision, my scenario, and it's not necessarily true to life in reality. And besides, sitting on that porch, I was thinking the same thing. And I told the farmer so. And here's what he said to me. 
We're not talking seeds and crops, boy. We're talking souls and the kingdom. And then turning from gazing at his fields to looking at me, he goes on. Both involve sowing. And there's three things about sowing that you need to know. So now what follows are the three lessons of the sower as best as I can recall them. They're not just about agriculture. If we are to be faithful to Jesus' call and the great commission, which applies as much to us as it did to those first disciples, then sowing seeds is exactly what we are all supposed to be doing. So pay attention. Sorry, kind of sounding like that farmer, right? The first lesson of the sower, spiritual growth does not happen overnight. The seed takes its own sweet time to grow. Its growth is mysterious. Its growth is gradual. Its growth is steady but slow. Sometimes that's really hard for us to take. We measure success often by how quickly it occurs. We're a world of Amazon, next day delivery, fast cash, instant oatmeal, and no matter how many G's you have, your, your high-speed internet never seems to be fast enough. It's hard not to expect results to happen immediately. It's hard to wait for something to grow. It's hard to be patient, especially that time before any of the first shoots of what you planted appear. But seeds take time. That gospel lesson I read, it all sounds so haphazard, doesn't it? Seed is is just randomly scattered, just thrown all over the place, not deliberately planted. And then the sower sort of forgets all about it. Sleep and rise, night and day, I don't know how. The Greek word for this is interesting. It's automate. (laughs) But it's automatic, not because of any sort of machine driven, but because it's God driven. Now eventually the farmer will see something. Not much at first, but ever so gradually until the time comes when, when, when we have to leap into action. Mark uses that word he's very fond of, oithos, immediately, at once. You know, that description of the whole process, I spent my first five years in the ministry in rural Manitoba. Most of the people in my church worked the soil in some capacity. And it's obvious that farming was never that leisurely and the harvest never that clearly defined. One person even told me after hearing the parable of the sower, you know, pastor, Jesus must have been a really good savior, but he sure wasn't much of a farmer. (laughs) But Jesus wasn't talking about agriculture at all, really. He is talking about harvesting souls, even though there are some similarities between the two. And one of which is that the process, both processes, take time. Often, lots of it. As I said, this can be a problem for us instant results people. (laughs) We expect God to validate our efforts now, immediately. You know, I remember going to this church planting workshop many years ago, and this presenter was talking about always being prepared. And, and, And I had to write this down. He goes, I was sitting in the airport waiting to board when a gentleman sat down beside me. We, we began talking, and soon I just asked him, are you sure you will go to heaven when you die? And he said he wasn't sure. So I explained the plan of salvation to him, and before they called our flight, he bowed his head, and we asked Christ to be part of his life. On the plane, this young lady took a seat next to me. When I told her I was a Christian, she said she had no idea what a Christian was. So I shared the gospel with her. It filled the void that was in her life, and, and she accepted Jesus before we landed. Then there was this taxi driver on the way to my hotel who was new to the country, and we started, and it went on and on like that. And those kind of testimonials, they, they always bothered me. I mean, sure, they intimidate me, sure, but they, they bothered me more. Not just their believability, because I'm sure they're true, 
but that the results were always so immediate for certain people. In my experience, it doesn't always work that way, or that quickly. In fact, I'd hazard a guess that it rarely does. It's not that dramatic responses to the gospel message do not take place. Oh, I know they do. It's just that those who plant the seeds are often not the ones who harvest them. When I've been witness to some of these life-changing transitions, these decisions for church or Christ or whatever, I'm usually seeing only the harvest of what other people have already planted. A parent, a co-worker, another pastor. I've seen the results happen because of somebody else's efforts. Which leads to the second lesson of the sower. The timing, the growth, the flowering of the seeds. <laughs> it's not our doing. It's God's. It goes back to those five key words about the farmer's analysis on what's taking place. He does not know how. I mean, how great is that, right? That's the wonder of seeds. Don't sweat it. You didn't start the process. You can't stop it. It's all God's doing. I mean, what a load off our backs that, that removes. Because I understand, as I'm talking here now, maybe some of you are feeling this sort of angst. You know, like, how am I ever going to do that? Well, you got to love that word, scatter. Just toss the seeds. It means don't even think about it. Don't calculate. We get so wrapped up and concerned about saying the right things, following the right strategy, and implementing the right program, we forget the mystery of growth. Sure. You can prepare the soil, you can water, you can fertilize, but the growth itself, it's all the Lord's doing. So don't worry. Whatever and however you communicate the gospel does not mean that much. And Jesus assures us that the Holy Spirit will give us the words that we need at those times. So whatever it is you do, in word, in deed, good or bad, stumbling or articulate, short or long term, it doesn't really matter. God is already at work in you and in that other person that he's brought near to you. God is in control. <laughs> Even as a pastor, one of the best things I've ever learned is the, the proper way to do any of this is just stay out of God's way and let it flow. Until harvest time, that is. That's the third lesson of the sower. We need to leap into action. The time will be right, ripe, literally. And it may come in the blink of an eye. We need to be like that farmer in my own mental image, grabbing his sickle at once, knowing the moment had come. This is where it's not like reaping grain. There's no set time for it. You'll never know, so you got to watch as you wait. you got to recognize that moment when the harvest before you is ripe. You know, maybe it's your next door neighbor who broke his leg and his lawn needs mowing. And you can help just for the love of neighborhood. In fact, this is a good push for our 30-mile mission. Find those kind of projects that we as a church can help you help someone else. Or maybe the harvest is a, is a friend telling you that her marriage is in trouble as you share a cup of coffee together. And you see her hands are already folded, waiting for your prayer. Or maybe it's that a pair of people, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons, that show up on your doorstep wanting to witness to you. Maybe you can do that to them. Or maybe at work. A colleague asks you candidly in the face of some sort of dilemma, how is it that nothing seems to bother you? Those are harvest moments. We should yippee and jump at them. It's, it's what we've been waiting for. But do we leap up and grab a sickle at once? Or do we hesitate? 
There's that saying, he who hesitates is lost. Only in this case, the one who's lost isn't the hesitator. It's the one who doesn't receive good news. It's the soul we could have touched in the name of Christ. Don't leave your harvest out in the field to wither, rot, or die. Because, let me tell you, whenever I've let that happen, whenever I've missed that kind of opportunity, and I know I have, I can't help but feel that it's me who's been lost and rotten. Back on the porch. By this time, it's almost sunset. The lemonade's long gone. The ice in the glass has melted. I've watched the farmer wait and watch and plant and harvest many times. And I can sense that he's an integral part of some organic, automatic process producing much grain. And his being faithful to that process. But just washing him, <laughs> it makes me feel almost exhausted myself. And the farmer knows this. And I can tell he's not particularly thrilled, especially about the almost part of me just sitting there. That's when it dawns on me that what I just simply assumed was his job is really mine as well. He's just showing me how to do it. And that's when he turns to me and says, fields are ripe, harvest is waiting. What are you waiting for? Which is a very good question for us all. What are we waiting for? God give you a harvest opportunity. Amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts, your minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, the fields are ripe, the harvest is waiting, and Jesus asked us to pray for harvesters to go out into the field. May we, O oh Lord, be an answer to that prayer. May we find those opportunities to see what has been planted around us and reap their benefits in you. We give you thanks, O oh Lord, for, for all our fathers especially those that have planted deep seeds of faith and love into us. We give you thanks for their reflection. May they and we all be that kind of faithful reflection of you. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord, look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.